Good morning. Good morning. Hey, all right. I like that. There's at least one person who, who responded to me. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that sounds so much better. You know what? I'm feeling happily outnumbered today. <laughs> I think that is the coolest thing. I really do. This has just been such a delight from beginning, and we're not anywhere near the end. We're just starting. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Dennis Carmen, and I am absolutely honored and blessed to have been the president and CEO of the United Way of Greater Plymouth County for the last 17 plus years. I am very, very lucky, uh, fortunate to be in the midst of such great people. And, and it's a testament today coming, watching you folks come in one after the other and, and saying, oh, gosh, I haven't seen you in so long. And I'm thinking it's because you're all so busy making the world a better place, which is really great. So I am so thankful you're here. I have very little to do today. That's lucky for you, right? Because you know how I am, most of you, you know? Um, I'm here to thank our sponsors. Uh, our friends at Family and Community Resources really went above and beyond as one of our community partners to step in. If you don't know this organization, they have been around for 50 plus years. And they're dead, yes, yeah. And, and when you hear, if you don't know them, they are dedicated to taking care of families and individuals who have been impacted by trauma, whether it's in the home, whether it's at school, whether it's in their community, and they've been doing it forever. They really have. So we're thrilled that we have its executive director, Pat Kelleher, its director of development, Joanne Hoops, and a number of people. If you haven't met them, please take the time. They have an event on the 5th of May, this Friday. It's sold out, I hear. But I'll bet you, if you twist Pat's arm and Joanne's arm, that you can probably make a donation, right? <laughs> so I think they'd appreciate that very much. The other sponsor is equally as amazing is our friends at Rockland Trust. Do you know what the year 1907's significance is? It's when, you, it's when Rockland Trust was established. Now, I'm a card-carrying member of the Rockland Trust family. My wife and I have been banking with them for over 40 years, and I absolutely remember, not only did I have one of these cards, but I remember what a rosy card is. Now, if you don't, do any of you know what a rosy card is? That's your bank card for Rockland Trust, what they used to call it, okay? So if, if, you, if you know someone and you want to test whether they're really a long-term <laughs> Rockland Truster, it's like a code word. Say rosy card, and they'll know what you're talking about. We are so thrilled about our friends at Rock and Trust. They are, they really mean what they say every day, that each relationship matters. And we are so thankful for them. And I don't get to introduce her, but Julie Beckham from Rock and Trust is in the house. And you're going to find out, you're going to find out what that means today in a, in a short while. So I also want to thank you, all of our table sponsors and all of the seats that have been filled today. It is wonderful. We have such a great crowd here. I cannot tell you how exciting it is. Now, I'm going to have a quote for you, and I'm going to ask your patience because you might get a little nervous about this quote, okay? <laughs> I'm just warning you ahead of time. A woman is like a bag of tea, a tea bag. A woman is like a tea bag. Can you say that? A woman is like a tea bag. A tea, not bag of tea, tea bag. Uh, tea bag is better. All right, so again, a woman is like a tea bag. Hold that thought. Okay. There are two women in my life that have been incredibly important and not because of their traditional roles. In fact, more because of their untraditional roles. My mom, Patricia Elizabeth Dowell Carmen, made sure that my brothers and I survived a very, very traumatic upbringing. My dad was an active alcoholic for most of my life, and there were some really hairy, scary times that I, I don't want to talk about, right? To this day, I don't want to talk about. But my mom was our hero. She made sure we went to church, went to school, were dressed as well as you could be dressed in hand-me-downs, whatever we had. But my, my brothers and I ended up surviving and thriving because of the care of this person who not only did all of the motherly tasks that she had to do, but she worked in order to make ends meet because we really were struggling for a lot of the times that my dad was not doing well. 
and that was a lot of those times. And so uh, I was able to get to Stonehill College, graduate, go on to the Ohio State University, get a double master's in, in, in social work and public administration. It, it, it would not have happened. I would not be where I am today were it not for that person, all right? All right yeah, you, you deserve that, amen. Okay. The second person, not surprising, her name is Teresa Jean Hennigan Carmen, and she's my wife of more than 40 years, okay? Which is also a terrific thing. She should be thanked for the tolerance and patience that she has. <laughs> so, I'm really appreciative of the unique role, and, and I have to tell you, as proud as I am of graduating at, from Stonehill College, magna cum laude, my wife graduated summa cum laude, all right? And she was graduated with a degree in accounting and went on to one of the big 10 accounting firms, and she's really smart. She's really smart. Only bad decision she ever made was marrying me. <laughs> anyway, you're all here. I don't have to tell you how incredibly impressive women are. I don't, but I'm gonna. The quote that I started with, I'm gonna end, it's from former first lady a long, long, hundreds of years ago, Eleanor Roosevelt. And she said, a woman is like a tea bag. You can't tell how strong she is until you put her in hot water. And can I get an amen for that? Now, this is also true. Our world is in a heck of a lot of hot water these days, isn't it, right? It is time, ladies, to stand up and be recognized for all of the impressive skills that you have always had and, and, and kind of dope slaps to the men for not appreciating all of that and stepping aside and letting you do some of the leading because really that's what's going to take to get us out of the hot water that we're into. So remember that quote. It's, really, it's, it's one of my favorites now and I'm going it, to, it's, it's very rare that I can remember these things, but again, a woman is like a tea bag. You can't tell how strong she is until you put her into hot water. Remember that. It is my delight to now leave you and leave you alone for the rest of the time. And I am delighted to be able to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Carol Martin from Harbor One Bank, who serves on our board in a number of roles, but as our board secretary, but also as the chair of our Community Impact Committee. She's been doing this kind of work for a long time. She matters in a big way. Carol, I'll leave you right, and thank you for all being here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, Dennis already did my introduction. I'm also um, proud to say that I work at Harbor One Bank. I head up the learning and development area, and um, it's a pleasure to be at this wonderful event and see so many friends, um, colleagues, um, board members that I work with, so thank you for being here. I also wanted to give a big shout out to the team at United Way for putting this on. Um, yes, cheers to them. Um, certainly Cindy and Darby you saw her as you walked in this morning and hard work done by Lisa and Kim today and you'll be hearing more from them later on um, they're they're terrific and thanks to my friends from Harbor One for being here to support me in the United Way today so thank you I want to share with you a little bit about my United Way journey when I started at Harbor One 25 years ago um, we had our United Way campaign, as we still do today, and I thought it was important that I should donate to my local community. So I made my donations and did my thing with my annual contributions. Um, one of the things that inspired me as part of that is um, our CEO, our retired CEO, Jim Blake. Um, he was the United Way um, campaign chair at the time and one of the things he would say is if you give your money to the United Way what they do is they disperse it to many organizations throughout the community so you basically give you one donation and you're all set you don't have to contribute to all all your organizations because they're the shepherds of your donations which 
to me was like easy. I make it one donation and I'm all set. Um, the nice part about the United Way is that they support people in 22 communities in the South Shore, so you know that your funds and your donations are going to people who are in need in the South Shore. The other thing that I was curious about in regards to the United Way was, so I'm making this donation, but what about all those agencies? So I decided to get involved with the Allocations Committee. And you might say, well, what's the Allocations Committee? And I'm hoping after today some of you will join me on the Allocations <laughs> Committee. Um, the Allocations Committee does incredibly wonderful work. And as Dennis said, I'm the co-chair of that Community Impact Committee. And the work that they do every year is just incredibly important. Um, the allocations panelists review proposals each year from agencies. Um, they look at the financials, they look at their budget, um, they assess the programs that they run, um, they make site visits to the agencies to ensure that your dollars are being used appropriately. Um, and the allocations committee is just fantastic group of people who work really hard. Um, I'm pleased that every year I have about 10 colleagues from Harbor One that join me on the Allocations Committee, and I'm sure some of you here participate in the Allocations Committee as well. Um, we go out and visit those um, agencies that are doing such great work in the community. Um, they're stewards of your donation dollars, so know that when you make a donation to the United Way, your donation dollars are going to agencies that have the greatest need and the biggest impact in the community. Um, the allocations process begins in January. We meet with the agencies to review the RFP process. In February, the agencies submit their proposals. This year, we went electronic. It was a big deal for us. It, it, <laughs> Kim knows we've always had paper applications, and it's, it's been a long process, but we're now electronic. Um, in March each year, we train about 50 um, allocations panelists who are on 12 teams who go out and visit the agencies and um, do the review of all the, the great work that is done in the community. And then um, in April they do their site visits and in May we make the recommendations and the Community Impact Committee as well as the board approves the dollars that get funded for the agency. Um, the funding is based on a scoring matrix and the available dollars and as I'm sure you all know, the need in the community is always greater than the dollars we have to give to each agency. Um, we fund 50 initiatives from over 30 agencies, which is incredible work that the United Way does for the, for the community. Um, I want you to know, and, and as I said, I hope some of you decide that you'd like to be on the Allocations Committee. Um, Kim and I would be happy to talk to you about that, but understand that the teams that go out and visit the agencies are thorough, thoughtful, um, they, they want to ensure that the money that they receive is going to good places um, that um, as I said, are stewards of your, your dollars and making sure that these agencies are receiving funding and do that work for your donation dollars. Um, I'm so thankful for the opportunity that I've had to be on the Allocations Committee for over the past 10 years. I've been a team captain. I've been on the board for eight years. I've been the chair for the last four years on the Community Impact Committee. Um, my journey with the United Way continues today with all of you being here for the Women's Leadership Conference. Um, or breakfast, I should say. It seems like a conference. There are so many people here. Um, and um, I encourage you to look on the back of your programs, and Lisa will talk more about this later, but there's a QR program, a QR code on the back, and I hope you join me in becoming a Women United leader today. Um, I guess that's all I had to say, but I want to thank you.
I want to thank you all for, for coming, and the United Way is important to me. I want to thank the board members that I see here today supporting as well. Um, I have the great and distinct pleasure of now introducing Reverend Eva Gilbert, who is from the New Life Temple of Holiness in Brockton. She's going to offer our reflection for today. Um, Reverend Gilbert has worked to expand um, the ministries of New Life in the community here in Brockton, and she provides spiritual and counseling for many women in the community. She's a great asset to her husband, Pastor Michael Gilbert, who serves with me on the United Way board, and it's my pleasure to introduce Eva Gilbert. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, it's all women. We should be making more noise than that. Come on, you know Mr. Dennis already said it, right? Well, he says that we are what that tea bag, but when you put it into the water, the hot water, I said boiling. So if you're in the boiling water, you got to make some noise. Yes, come on, you all. Yes, yes, we ought to be excited about what's going on today and to have all the women, listen, all the beautiful women here with us and so let me my husband already told me you know when you get there you know be good and just do what you got <laughs> so I don't know if he's watching or whatever so I better be good and do what a master do okay but we just want to say thank goodness God for uh, Mr. Dennis coming we just want to thank Miss Carol you know for um, bringing me introducing me and to all of the beautiful women, I love women. I love women. <laughs> and to see our DA crews over there. Okay, so let me do what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> all right, all right, let me get back. Okay, so um, actually they say reflection, but I'm going to do an invocation, a little prayer for us. Is that okay? Yes, yeah. Okay, you can bow your heads, however, you know, you do it, it's fine with me, okay? Um, Father, we come, we come together as women to give thanks for all that each of us do. We come to embrace our differences and our similarities. We hope to bring courage and life with beauty, boldness, compassion, and caring for our families and our friends and for each other. To hear from Ms. Julie Beckham, who will give us tools to make changes and adjustments that we can take back with each of us. Father, we thank you for the United Way, Ms. Lisa, and the staff, along with all other supporters. We thank you for Thorny Thorn Lee Country Club, who provide a beautiful breakfast for us this morning and a place to come where we can unite together as women. I pray that we are standing strong in the number of 100 women and more this is our prayer today. Amen. When I said more, you all should have made some noise right there. We're trusting. We're trusting because as we continue to move on, we want the room to be packed. Okay. And so I like to share a story that uh, Mr. Dennis shared with me. I know he already shared one, but when I met them in the office and I thought this was an awesome um, story. It says, one day a man said to God, it's called Heaven and Hell, the Parable of the Long Spoon. It says, one day a man said to God, God, I would like to know what heaven and hell are like. God showed the man two doors. Inside the first one, in the middle of the room, was a large, long table with a large pot of vegetable stew. It smelled delicious like the breakfast today. It smelled delicious and it made the man's mouth water, but the people sitting around the table were thin and sickly. They appeared to be famous. They were holding spoons with very long handles and each found it possible to reach into the pot of stew and take a spoonful. But because the handle was longer than their arms, they could not get the spoons back into their mouths. The man shuddered at sight of their misery and suffering. God said, you should have seen hell 
Behind the second door, the room appeared exactly the same. There was a large rung table with a large pot a wonderful vegetable stew that made the man's mouth water. The people had the same long hand handled spoons, but they were well, well nourished and plump and laughing and talking. The man says, I don't understand. God smiled. It's simple. He said, love only requires one skill. These people learn early on to share and feed one another while the greedy only think of themselves and so we're here today right because we're thinking about others and so at this time I am going to turn it over to Miss Kim Scotland the director of the community relations and marketing and thank you all for your time Good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to see so many powerful and caring women in here this morning, and we're so grateful for you all showing up with us united. So thank you for being here. Um, we all know that the needs in Greater Plymouth County are immense, and we can tackle them best by working together. So my role this morning is to share with you a bit about what we're seeing in our communities and how we are working to meet those needs. At UWGPC, aka United Way of Greater Plymouth County, we pay attention to the pulse of our community and we work closely with our funded partner agencies to identify solutions. Currently, we are funding 47 impactful initiatives at 26 amazing partner agencies through our Live United Fund, some of which join us in this room this morning. We also use quantitative and qualitative data from community needs assessments and are in frequent communication with all of the United Ways in Massachusetts to align our priorities. So here's a little bit about what we know, and you'll see the um, information up on the screen here too. According to the US Census Bureau, 7.5% of individuals in Greater Plymouth County are currently living in poverty. And it is heartbreaking to know that this number is on an upward trend. From 2021 to 2023, South Shore Community Action Council found the top unmet needs of low-income individuals and families living on the South Shore to be affordable heat, utilities and housing, financial emergencies, food and nutrition, transportation, legal assistance, and early education and childcare. Signature Healthcare Brockton Hospital's 2022 Community Needs Assessment found the top three community concerns to be mental health, transportation, and substance use. And lastly, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health's COVID-19 Community Impact Survey found sadly that 27% of individuals in Massachusetts are worried about getting groceries for their family. And this number skyrockets to 48% of those with an income below 35,000. That same Community Impact Survey found that 44% overall are worried about paying at least one expense or bill in the next few weeks and this skyrockets to 67% of those with an income under 35,000. So just a little bit about what we're seeing as the needs in the community as all of you know and are seeing firsthand with many of our partner agencies. So at United Way, we have identified the following critical needs to focus on. And it's very important to know that all of our work is viewed through a lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging for our neighbors. So our Lib United poverty focused areas of intervention feeding our families, housing and homelessness, access to affordable health services, support for children and youth, and support for job training and placement. So we've identified the needs. Now what's, what are we doing about it? I'm gonna share a little bit about United Way's role. So United Way fills the gaps. We convene and we advocate. We're an active member and or leader of many local coalitions, including the Brockton Area Hunger Network, the Brockton Interfaith Community, Community Services of Greater Brockton, the Drug and Dangerous Children's Initiative Advisory Board, Greater Brockton and Greater Plymouth Community Health Network areas, Plymouth County District Attorney's Office Domestic Violence Task Force, the Plymouth County Emergency Food and Shelter Program Local Board, South Shore Regional Network to End Homelessness, Southeast Mass Volunteer Council, and the Greater Plymouth Council of Human Service Agencies. 
We prioritize all families and individuals in need in our 22 communities that we serve. So as you can see on this map here, last year we served over 57,000 individuals. Um, and based on the data that we have on demographics, 64% of these 57,000 are women and girls. So I'm going to walk through some data looking at our five focus areas. And I'll warn you, it's a lot of numbers, but I think it's important that we share the impact that United Way and our partners that we've all made together. Um, I'm going to go through our five categories that we just went over and share some data. So in the category of families fed, 78,906 meals were distributed to feed hungry families last year. 2,712 people are no longer food insecure. Housing and shelter. 356 individuals accessing crisis housing engage with case management to develop a client-centered service plan. 689 families or individuals were placed in housing. And 425 individuals in crisis avoided eviction. Improving affordable health services. 2,535 people received preventative care support leading to healthier lives. 189 people received domestic violence services. And 1,763 children and adults ate healthier, increased physical activity, or moved towards a healthier weight. Support for children and youth. 1,157 children received academic growth through after-school programs. 21 youth graduated high school, and 195 youth gained the knowledge, skills, and credentials to get a good job. And 251 people were positively impacted through college preparation programs. And last but not least, support for job training and placement. 40 people increased their disposable income by accessing benefits and or reducing costs. And 25 people were helped with financial education, literacy, coaching, or other services to receive a job. Together, we are creating lasting change and advancing economic opportunities for all. But there is more work to do, and as Carol said, we need your help now more than ever. Um, we know that when we supply needed resources, positive things happen in our community. So I would like to end my remarks by sharing an example of this positivity. Um, we love to share impact stories of the work we do with our partner agencies. So I'd like to share Marissa's story and just note her name has been changed to protect her privacy. So United Way Partner Agency noticed that one of the parents at their nursery never wore a jacket when dropping off her child despite the freezing winter temperatures. The mother was also falling behind on paying her tuition fee at the daycare. Marissa was about to withdraw her child from the center because she could no longer afford the expensive daycare. She was working two jobs to support her daughter and her elderly mother that lived with them. When the organization's director asked Marissa into her office to ask if she needed a coat, the woman broke down in tears. She was struggling doing everything in her power to keep her small family fed, clothed, and sheltered. And she shared that she couldn't afford a coat for the winter. She was barely scraping by, even with working 80 hours a week. The weight lifted from her shoulders when she was told that her child could be provided a scholarship thanks to United Way's Live United Fund. She cried tears of joy when she learned that she could continue to bring her daughter to the center, and she wasn't alone. And I think that's what we all do. We all support our community, our neighbors, and make sure that everyone feels like they're not alone and they have a place in the community. So. It is now my distinct pleasure to welcome my colleague Lisa Machowski to the podium. Lisa is our Director of Resource Development and a special shout out, Lisa is the mastermind behind this morning's um, <laughs> Women United event and she's gonna share a lot more about the work that we can do as United Women, so. Good morning again, everyone, and um, I just can't thank you enough for joining us here today. I am thrilled to see so many Greater Plymouth County women here to launch your own version of United Way's Women United. Congratulations on being the first group to step forward in unison to unite people, ideas, and resources to improve lives and to build a strong community by sharing your talent heartfelt philanthropy, skills, and abilities. 
Nationally and globally, approximately 75,000 women are members of the Women United program. They are working together to solve each of their community's most pressing problems. Women United's national goals are to develop a powerful voice for women in philanthropy and to become an engine for growth by annually raising over $100 million nationally, annually. We believe that when women leaders join together, their voices and vision and leadership can make a phenomenal impact on the community. And I think we all know that. As part of Women United, I hope you will help improve the lives of others through volunteering, fundraising, and raising awareness. Women's philanthropy moves mountains. What is women's philanthropy in today's world? Women are individual donors, charitable foundation founders, giving circle members, board members, and presidents of international charities. Women are providing the resources for academics, community-based projects, and mentoring. Projects are funded from educational engagement and networking events such as this one. Funding supports after-school programming, policy research and advocacy, leadership training, and more. In general, recent research on just over 200 women managed and started foundations reported their top three areas of funding were women and girls general funding, 52% of funds distributed, women and children funding, specifically 15% of funds distributed, and low income women's funding, 12% of funds distributed. Most of us probably know of Melinda French Gates of the Gates Foundation. Co-Impact, a philanthropy collaborative backed by Melinda French Gates and other prominent women donors, provided more than $161 million in grants to health, education, and gender equality-focused organizations across Africa, Asia, and Latin America in 2022. Women are making impact. Linda Mason is the founder of the well-known company Bright Horizons, the international on-work site child care company she started here in Massachusetts. Presently, she is chairwoman of the Boston Foundation. Quoting Linda, I have always felt a responsibility and a desire to give back where I can. It has frankly been what has fueled me throughout my life. There are so many people in communities that have so much to offer, but are held back by societal barriers and discrimination. The Women's Philanthropy Institute Women and Girls Index reported the following. The year 2019 saw philanthropic support for equal pay inspired by the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team winning the World Cup and ongoing charitable giving in, in response to the Me Too movement. Whether you are giving $125 or $25,000 to your area of interest, you are a philanthropist. Everyone here this morning is a philanthropist. You are in fabulous company. I would like you all to take a moment to shake the hand of the woman next to you and congratulate her or him for their philanthropy. <laughs> <laughs> what will Women United of Greater Plymouth County seek to accomplish? Where will you make an impact? What programs would you like to fund? Contributions from today's event go to our Live United Fund, which supports the areas of feeding families, housing and homelessness, accessing affordable health care, supporting school children with tutoring and after school care, and aspire to hire through job training and placement. In the future, we will ideally see you decide what areas of greatest need you would like to fund. Through, throughout Massachusetts, Women United positively impacts in many different areas. 
The Cape and, Un and Islands Women United has invested more than 200,000 into the community through emergency funding programming and micro grants and has supported more than 300 families through their annual community baby showers. United Way of New Bedford is hostess for the Women Run United Mother's Day 5K Run. United Way of New Bedford's Women United and Women Run Inc. are teaming up for Mother's Day Run. It is a fun and healthy event where family and friends come together to honor the amazing women in their lives and raise funds to bridge the gap and ignite positive change for women in their community. And if anybody here is a runner, feel free to go down there next weekend and I'm sure they'll let you jump right in. <laughs> women United Rhode Island has raised more than $5.3 million and have made grants of more than $1 million to support childhood literacy. Women's Initiative of the United Way of Central Massachusetts, which is the fitchburg Lemonster area, is a volunteer-based women's group whose mission it is to ignite positive change for girls through philanthropy and women's leadership. Working with volunteer com com committees of community leaders, the Women's Initiative engages hundreds of members and donors to support programs that improve and empower the lives of adolescent girls in central Massachusetts. Their goal is to reduce the incidence of violence affecting young girls ages 10 to 14 through mentoring, educational opportunities, and financial literacy. All of you here today know there is work to be done in Greater Plymouth County for families, for women and girls. We know refrigerators are in need of food, babies are in need of clothing, kids need tutoring after school, and women must have space, safe spaces when fleeing with their children from domestic violence. What will be your areas of impact? Who among you will lead on the committee for fundraising, for volunteerism, and for networking? United Way is reflective of our communities. You are that community. What mountains will you move? Thank you. Okay, before we move on to our keynote, my wonderful colleague Darby is here with a basket. Some of you I know have already put your business card in the basket to win the two, no, I'm sorry, the four Red Sox tickets, a nice family day out, four Red Sox tickets, very generously donated by Harbor One. Our friend Carol brought those along, so thank you, Harbor One. So if anybody would like to put their business card or borrow somebody else's business card and put your name in it, Darby will be walking around. Just raise your hand and give her a wave uh, if you miss that coming in. <laughs> and if you work for United Way, um, we'll pass on that opportunity. <laughs> okay. Not everyone. Not everyone thinks personal finance is a topic to sing and dance about, but Julie Beckham has made a career out of it. Creator of Ms. Money and the Coins, a musical about saving, sharing, and spending money, and the no shame in this money game podcast. Julie is an AVP of Financial Education and Development and Strategy Officer at Rockland Trust Bank. She's a certified financial educator, an accredited financial counselor, and a graduate of New York University's Tisch School for the Arts. Julie creates and implements engaging and entertaining financial education programming for colleagues, customers, and the community. Before coming to Rockland Trust, Julie was the community relations manager at Blue Hills Bank, where she managed the bank's charitable foundation, Women in Philanthropy, sponsorships, matching gifts, and volunteer programming. While in that role, she developed an appreciation for the impact local nonprofits make on individuals and families in the greater Boston area, and has become involved with several organizations since. Julie is a five-time writer for the Panmas Challenge, a member of the Advisory Council of Boston Money Management at Ethos, a Selection Committee member of the Citizens Housing and Planning Association, the Vice Chair of the Town of Canton's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and a member of YW's Lead Boston Class of 
2023. And I am happy to say that she is our inaugural keynote speaker this morning. Please welcome Julie Beckham. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Lisa, for that very fancy introduction. <laughs> I have to admit, this is my first keynote speaking experience, and I'm more than a little excited. I was so excited when I was asked to speak that I called my son, he's in college, to tell him. I thought he would be so impressed, but he laughed. <laughs> and I was like, why are you laughing? And he said he didn't realize until he got to college and had to attend seminars with keynote speakers that it was a keynote. He, his whole life, when he heard that phrase, he thought it was a kino speaker, like, like the kino game at restaurants and bars and yeah. And, and he wondered why it was such a big deal to be a kino speaker, the one who calls out the kino numbers. Now I know why he was laughing. Many of you might be thinking, how does someone with a degree in theater end up in a bank? Trust me, I spend a lot of time thinking about that myself. Others may be thinking, Julie Beckham, I wonder if she's related to that writer, Beverly Beckham. I am, that's my mother. You've probably read her columns in the Globe and the Herald and the Patriot Ledger over the last 40 years, and if you have, you know way too much about me. <laughs> Others may be thinking, Julie Beckham, hmm, that voice sounds familiar. It might. My sister, who sounds a lot like me, is LBF on WROR's morning show. She's probably playing super smart with somebody right now. <laughs> I actually have a brother and a father too, but this breakfast is just for women, so we'll <laughs> ignore them for now. So with a degree in theater and these writer and radio personalities for relatives, most of you are not thinking that I'm nervous, but I am. Because standing in front of you, women in business, on behalf of the United Way, is an honor and kind of intimidating. We all have interesting stories. We all have had struggles and triumphs that are worth sharing. And if each of you had the opportunity to stand up here today, I'm certain our stories would have many things in common. Because the longer I live, the more I realize that we are more alike than different. But moments change us. Chance encounters, random opportunities. 13 years ago, I had a random opportunity. I was asked how I might imagine a bank bringing financial education to the community in a creative way. My answer, due to my background in theater, my love of musicals, and my possibly being part Muppet, was to write a musical about money and perform it in elementary schools for free. And that idea opened the door to a career in banking. <laughs> the majority of the last 13 years playing catch-up and doubting myself in a field I had no experience in. But like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz when she realized that she already had what she needed to click her way home, I've come to realize the skills I learned pursuing my career in theater were everything I needed to survive and thrive in the world of banking. So today, in honor of my theatrical background and my inability to do anything without props, <laughs> I present to you the five, six, seven, eight ways my background in theater has helped me prepare, prepare for banking and big business. Number one, show up. Look. You all did it this morning, here we are. Getting up and out in the morning is challenging as a woman when you have no one to consider but your own self. But I am sure that more than half of you here had someone to deal with this morning and many of you had many little someones to deal with. God, I remember the days where it felt like I had lived an entire life before getting out the door on time. Just to show up and start the day for real. It's no easy feat. And you made it, you did it, you made it, good job. Because showing up is important. 
In sixth grade, I was cast as Munchkin number three in a production of The Wiz at my middle school. <laughs> Having starred as Dorothy in a produ production of The Wizard of Oz in my fifth grade play, this was a low blow. But there are no small parts, only small players, says Shakespeare. So, I showed up every day for rehearsal, and I watched. I didn't sit in the back of the cafetorium and open my Trapper Keeper and do my homework and talk to my friends. I sat at the table behind the director and I watched. And when the director needed someone to walk across the stage and point at the melted wicked witch and sing hallelujah, he turned around and he saw me. <laughs> I got the extra part and the solo line and was suddenly not only munchkin number three, but the hallelujah girl, and on my way to getting a real name the following year. Like I said, it's important to show up. Number two, say yes and. There's a rule in improvisation. That's when you make up what you're supposed to say on the spot. There's no script. Remember that show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Yeah, it's like that. Basically, it means that if we're improvis improvising and I go up to you and say, uh, doctor, doctor, I think there's something in my eye. You don't say, I'm not a doctor. That totally stops the scene, dead, nothing else to say. Instead, if I run up to you and I say, doctor, doctor, there's something in my eye, you say yes and whatever. You say, yes, and it's spreading across your face. Yes, and it's making smoke come out of your head. Yes, and it's doing the Macarena. It doesn't matter what you say. Saying yes and something is better than saying, no, I'm not a doctor. Using yes and has both saved me and given me opportunities. At auditions, Julie, can you do a back walkover? Yes, and I can do a front walkover too. And then I am in my apartment, making so much noise for the downstairs neighbors as I tried to recreate gymnastic skills I learned while I was 12 to prepare for my callback. But I got the callback. At work, Julie, can you let me know what percentage of employees used the matching gift program and what the average gift was last year? Yes, and when do you need that by? Tomorrow, perfect. <laughs> And though I have no idea how to do that, I use all of the resources around me to get the information I need to calculate an answer. Both instances, I couldn't do those things on the spot. I needed time. I needed help. But I said yes and anyway because I needed them to have confidence in me just like an improv. You need your scene partner to know that you've got this, that you've got them. That's what every boss needs to know, even when you don't. They need you to know that you'll figure it out. Number three, know when to say no. I know, I just said, say yes and, and now I'm saying say no. Yes, I, you, here's what I mean. As a performing artist, an actor, a singer, a dancer, uh, you say yes to opportunities, all of them, because you never know what they'll lead to. You hope they lead to other opportunities and not staring at the bottom of the dumpster. Sorry, I tend to be dramatic. It's an occupational hazard. I get cast in a workshop of a new musical. That's theater code for no pay but ripe with potential opportunities. The musical is about the first burlesque singer named Lydia Thompson. Fun fact, she was the first woman to wear tights on stage. Scandalous. <laughs> I play Lydia, and a voice teacher sees me in the workshop and sees something in me. He offers me lessons. I say I can't afford lessons. He says I should ask my parents to support me while I pursue my dreams so I don't have to do children's theater and cocktail waitress to pay my rent and expenses while I audition. I say they supported me by sending me to college and believing in my dream. I'm luckier than most. Thanks for the offer, but I can't afford the lessons. He says he'll give me the lessons for free. Okay, I say. This man's in his 70s and he huffs and puffs on his way to the piano, so I decide that my chances of ending up in a dumpster are slim. <laughs> and maybe the banker in me was already there. The return on investment was pretty good since I was paying nothing. The first few lessons are good. I feel like I'm learning something. I'm amused by his stories. He seems to have worked with everyone I admire. But he starts to get a little impatient and moody, which I think is weird, but okay. And then one day he opens his door to the apartment wearing only his underwear. 
No. That's where you say no. <laughs> when I start full time at the bank, I say yes to everything. We're supporting the Pan Mass Challenge. Sure, I'll ride. Do you have a bike? I'll borrow one. Do you even know how to ride a bike, Mom? My kids ask me. Yes? Well, 50 miles is a lot. <laughs> they are right. <laughs> a nonprofit we support is doing a stair climb. 46 flights. No problem. With a 15 pound backpack? Sure. Hey, Julie, we're supporting the polar plunge. You run and jump into Boston Harbor and Southie on New Year's Day. Are you in? No way. <laughs> Sometimes you have to know when to draw the line and know when to say no. Number four, stand up straight. For several summers in my early 20s, I did this thing called summer stock. That's theater code for working 18 hours a day and getting paid $90 a week for the experience of doing theater all summer long. And even though it sounds and sometimes is unbearable, it is also exhilarating in a coveted gig. In Summerstock, the producers use all the same dozen or so performers as the ensemble and all of the shows, which means someone like me can play a Yemenite woman in Milk and Honey, a wife in The King and I, and a whore in Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, all in the same season. This is also why all five foot four of me was cast as a showgirl in Will Rogers Follies. There's this song Will Rogers sings to his wife. The idea is that he is presenting her with all of these jewels, and as he sings and describes each jewel, a showgirl appears at the top of the staircase. Each jewel has accompanying lyrics that describe its magnificence. Sapphires so blue and brilliant. You get the idea. I'm Topaz. Bedazzled from head to toe in a shimmering golden yellow in my three-inch heels at the top of this enormous staircase. And no, I don't fall, thank God. But as I stand as tall as I can doing all of my showgirl moves, Will Rogers sings, Topaz, not quite so precious. <laughs> I am so uncomfortable teetering, stretched into a costume that is made for someone who is not me. I have to stand up straight and tall and be topaz and present myself to Mrs. Rogers like I'm a diamond. Ever tried negotiating for a raise? A more flexible schedule? Have you ever tried talking to a vendor knowing that you are not their top client but needing them to treat you like you are? Or maybe you've been passed on a promotion that you've been asked to train someone to do your job that you should be doing. And I know all of you have had the horrible, uncomfortable feeling where you're suddenly in a room with diamonds, sapphires, emeralds, and you had to de defend your idea or your work. Sometimes you're topaz. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Be topaz. Stand up straight. What's not so precious right now may prove valuable in time. Number five, keep it upbeat. Most auditions I went to in New York, people asked you to sing 16 bars of an uptempo and 16 bars of a ballad. For reference, the song Happy Birthday is eight bars. You always start with your uptempo. Whoever is watching, the director, choreographer, hears hundreds of people a day. You gotta keep it peppy. If you make someone laugh, smile, or simply look up, maybe they'll let you sing your ballad, but never the other way around. Start with your ballad and you're a goner. Nobody wants to hear on my own 100 times a day, no matter how much they love Les Mis. <laughs> I can't help but bring that mentality to the office. Who wants to hang out 40 hours a week with a ballad singing the same old dirge? As a musical theater actor, we're often criticized by more serious actors who don't believe that bursting into a song is natural. I mean, what is so unnatural about that? So there's this tendency by musical theater actors to take ourselves overly serious to prove we can act, usually by singing heartfelt ballads. I think there's a tendency to take ourselves a little too seriously in the business world too, right? When I first started in full-time banking, I tried really hard to fit in, look serious. I got a bunch of 
blazers from the sample sale at Frugal Fanny's. <laughs> It was as if I was dressing the part. But as I got more comfortable, I realized that not bringing my up-tempo self was not helping anyone. Once I started incorporating that in my work, it was contagious. People often tell me I have the fun job, but I think I just have fun at my job. Not every day is up-tempo, but when you get to choose your 16 bars, keep it upbeat. Number six. You won't die, it's just the floor. This one needs a little explaining. <laughs> I had a Russian ballet teacher my first year at NYU named Kira. Although my class was not advanced, we were gifted with an incredible teacher who encouraged us not just to dance, but to fly. At first, we did not fly, we fell. And it didn't hurt as much as it was embarrassing, but Kira didn't think so. She stood next to the piano, conducting the pianist to play faster and faster so we could leap higher and higher, and she'd yell, fly, fly, if you fall, you won't die, it's just the floor. <laughs> and she was right. We fell, and we didn't die. And every once in a while, it really did feel like we were flying. When you work for a company, things change and you have no control. When I started in banking, I worked for Hyde Park Savings Bank, but that became Blue Hills Bank. Just a name change, no big deal. But a few years later, Blue Hills Bank was acquired by Rockland Trust, and it hit different, as the kids say. To some, it felt like we were in mid-flight and there was suddenly no floor below. What was next? As an actor, Nothing is certain. Not your current job, and definitely not your next one. You get so used to rejection that it almost feels normal to have 150 auditions in your calendar without a show in sight. You're always ready to pivot, reinvent yourself, try something new. So when the announcement was made that we were being acquired, it was, it was like I was in mid-leap in Kira's ballet class. I knew coming down was going to be tough, that I might fall, but I also knew that I wasn't going to die. And this outlook allowed me to see this change as an opportunity. And if Rockland Trust wasn't there when I landed, I would land somewhere else. I think about Kira and this concept of flying when I think about my work in financial education. All the experiences I've talked about so far, living in New York, pursuing my dream, they allowed me to fly without an intolerable amount of fear or danger because I have a net. I define my net as my family, my community, my friends. They encourage me, support me, and there's a part of me that knows that I will always be okay. Some of us don't leap not because we can't, but because if we do fall, we have no net. The part of my net that I didn't see or give as much value to until I myself became financially educated is my financial net. Although growing up, I would never have identified myself as wealthy, I do have access to money, credit, and financial services. Not everyone can say that. Currently, it is a privilege to have the kind of net I have been given. Others have to construct their own, string by string. And we, as a society, don't even give them the tools. Only 18 states in the United States require a semester-long class in personal finance to graduate from high school. Massachusetts is not one of them. That means only the families who are financially educating their children at home or leaving them with generational wealth and access to professional advisors are the ones who are entering this world with the net required for truly flying into a life of opportunity. When we talk about inequities, financial inequity is where it all begins. Our social services are supposed to supply us with a net when we need it. Unemployment when we're out of a job, access to food when we can't afford it. Nonprofit organizations like the United Way help fill the gap when those services aren't enough. And at this point, so many couldn't survive without these supplementary services that provide so much care, support, and buffering for so many struggling. Banks like Rockland Trust are working to create access through education and outreach so that more people can fly and reach their financial goals. But it is a great endeavor, and it's only with an acknowledgement of these financial inequities, meaningful public-private partnerships, and the generosity of you here today that we can, like the United Way says, lift up our communities together. 
Number seven, find your light. Have you ever gone to a show, usually a school show or a community theater, where an entire scene happens in the dark? Or maybe someone who's usually not on stage is introducing themselves and they are literally standing in the dark talking when there's clearly light one step to their left. They haven't found their light. It's actually something that you have to get used to. Yes, you can feel it, but it takes practice to know the feeling and then adjust. When you go to one of these shows in the future, you might see older, more experienced performers subtly shift a scene or pull others into the light. These are the kind of in-between moments that I love to watch. Actors helping actors, silent communication and collaboration, all to bring someone into the light so that people can see them. I found my light at Rockland Trust. I could say that I found it because I have more experience, more confidence, and I know more about what I'm doing. And, and although that might be true, it's not the whole truth. I found my light because I've been surrounded by others who have led me to it who see the best in me and want me to shine. That little show I proposed 13 years ago, writing a musical about money and performing it for free in elementary schools, it's called Miss Money and the Coins, and I've performed it 500 times at more than 150 elementary schools to over 80,000 Massachusetts students since 2011. <laughs> And as of last month, Miss Money's Classroom, a virtual version of Miss Money and the Coins, complete with an animated video, five downloadable songs, activity sheets, and a teacher-driven lesson plan is available online for free for teachers and families anywhere in the world. And by the end of this month, it will be offered in both English and Spanish. Miss Money in the Coins and Miss Money's Classroom is successful because it's fun, engaging, and entertaining. If kids like to be entertained while they learn, then the little kid and all of us might like that too. Which is why at Rockland Trust, I've been given the go-ahead to create. We've produced engaging videos to warn senior citizens about scams and entertaining podcasts to break down personal finance jargon to adults in a no-shame zone. And because I'm still having fun, I've got to invite more people to the party. We just started the Money Circle at Rockland Trust, which is an employee resource group dedicated to educating and empowering our employees with financial education so that all 1,800 plus of us can have access to the kind of knowledge, resources, and services we offer our customers and community members. I'm fortunate to have found my light, and some of those who have nudged me into my light are here today. As women, as leaders, Let's remember and be intentional about leading other women into the light. The more of us who shine make the path brighter for others who might be stumbling in the dark. Yes. Number eight, know your exits. Timing is everything and I think my time has run out. <laughs> No, for real. It's important to get in and get out. I was recommended to the United Way today by a colleague who reportedly said, Julie would make a great morning speaker. She'll definitely wake you up. <laughs> I hope I did. I also hope that my five, six, seven, eight ways show business has prepared me for big business reminds you about your unique paths to where you are today and inspires you to f reflect on where you want to be tomorrow. Collectively, our stories are powerful. They're true, and they're how we inspire more women to create their own unique paths of success and bring them into the light. Thank you to all of you for giving me your time. I know how valuable it is. And thank you for the United Way for inviting me. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Wow, that was excellent, thank you. I, I love how she interwove skills and abilities to career change to success, because I think so many of us go through career transitions, expected, planned, or unexpected, and I think that the confidence that you brought uh, to your change and, and growth really came through and, and inspired everybody, so thank you.
And as a token of our appreciation, here is a Women United bag for you. Okay, I think my friend Darby has the basket of uh, folks to pick whoever it is that's going to take a nice family to a baseball game. Come on up. And I don't have my last name. <laughs> You put it up there? Okay. Oh, wonderful. All right. I am thrilled to announce the winner of the four tickets to go to a baseball game is Patricia Dorellen from the Brockton Day Nursery. Now, just to close, again, heartfelt thanks. Thank you so much for coming. This really means the world to me today. And just to remind you to get more involved with United Way, with Women United, on your program, please take it home and scan the QR code, send me an email, give us a call, and more than anything, please always live united. Thank you.